Let's continue with spatial data. So we have been talking about uh, geographic maps, and now let's move on to talk about spatial fields. So first, let's actually transition from the two by thinking about the intersection of spatial fields and geographic maps, and that is topographic maps. So what is that idiom? Well, we've got this geography. Uh, it's got some sort of geometric information associated with it. But in addition, instead of associating with a table like we did with thematic maps, we're associating, we're associating it with a field, a scalar spatial field. And remember that what are these spatial fields? It's where you have a number of, uh, you have a grid and at every cell in that grid, you're doing some sort of sample of a quantitative attribute. So we have our attribute for a whole bunch of points on the map. Um, often these are regularly sampled or irregularly sampled, either way. And what we do with these maps is we derive data. In particular, we're deriving an ISO line. An ISO line um, or an ISO contour is a line of equal value for that scalar attribute. So in this case on the map, we're looking for the lines where um, things are all the same height above sea level. And uh, typically these form closed contours. And so then we can see uh, something about the terrain just from this two-dimensional view. In particular, if there are a bunch of contour lines close together, that means it's a really steep slope. And so without using uh, three-dimensional rendering directly, we're able to read off some of that structure. We can get a sense of where we've got the top of a mountain with a bunch of smaller and smaller little iso contours. Um, and so we avoid some of the challenges of 3D that uh, we talk about in the segment on rules of thumb. Um, and also we can use, I mean, of course we could just color code heights, but what if we need to use the color for some other attribute value? Um, so it can, we can still use that. Like here we see different kinds of land use that are color coded. We didn't need to use that for the height above sea level. Of course, there can be some clutter from these additional lines compared to the geographic features you might be interested in, like, you know, borders or towns or roads or so on. So it's a trade-off. Now, this same idea of isosurfaces is something we can think about in other contexts as well. So um, if we've got volumetric data, and then if we actually have one of these three-dimensional volumes and at every uh, point in that grid we're sampling, sometimes those are called voxels. Um, again, with a scalar spatial field, we have one quantitative attribute per grid cell. And when we really need to understand shapes and spatial relationships between shapes in this volumetric region, that's when we want to um, worry about spatial field rendering. Now there's two main idioms for this. And in one of them, it's exactly like what we did for the topographic map. We are deriving data where we're finding ISO contours, but we're doing it for surfaces, not just lines, but surfaces. So finding surfaces within this uh, three-dimensional volume, um, and we can pick a particular level of the scalar value and find the surface for that. And if we choose those values appropriately and carefully, we can see a bunch of structures. So here, what we've done is we're looking at, uh, of course, a tooth, and by setting different values of that scalar parameter for the density that we're getting from the medical imaging device, we're able to see the nerve inside versus the outside versus some internal structure. So each one of these geometric surfaces that we computed is being rendered with a somewhat different color coding and a, uh, or careful use of opacity and transparency so that we can actually see multiple surfaces at once. Now there's some limits. We're not gonna be able to see you know, hundreds and hundreds of isosurfaces, but we can certainly see more than one. Um, and that in part, it depends on how carefully uh, the characteristics of the data itself and the choices you've made for color and opacity. Now there's one other main thing we can do. We don't have to actually compute these geometric surfaces. Uh, what's called direct volume rendering, as the name implies, is where you don't derive an intermediate geometric representation, which you then render using standard computer graphics techniques. Instead, you directly map from these scalar values uh, for example, the density in a medical imaging, directly from those two, color and opacity. And that's what we're seeing here on the right um, is where we're going directly from those without an intermediate uh, geometric representation. 
So uh, in both cases, these have a lot of interesting algorithmic challenges and people have gone deep into those. Uh, so we're not gonna cover that here. We're just sort of thinking about this at the idiom level of what's happening, especially in terms of when we do and don't derive additional geometry. Okay, what if instead of having just one value uh, for every cell in the spatial field, what if we have many? And that's the case with vector and tensor fields. Uh, and the set of idioms that apply to um, uh, visualizing these is actually the same for both. But we're going to start with vector fields because they're easier to think about. That's where we have two attributes. Um, and so we can think uh, of this as often uh, showing flows, whether measured in reality or simulated with something like computational fluid dynamics. Uh, this is visualization of flow fields. So the major classes of idioms, and we're actually seeing some examples of these on the upper right, um, we could use a glyph. We could actually, at many of these points in space, at these uh, you know, grid sampled points in the grid, we can show some glyph trying to show something like the direction of flow and the magnitude of flow at that spot. This is a very local way to show it. Uh, we make a local decision for a glyph at e what, each one of these points in space. Um, and that's actually what we're seeing um, uh, along the top here, uh, we're seeing a number of local glyphs. Now, we could also do something where we're actually deriving data. We could say, well, I'm not just going to take at every point a direction and a, and a magnitude. I'm going to try to trace a particle and simulate what would happen as it uh, went along with that flow. And so in this case, um, we think of having a seed point. Where do you start the particles? That's a choice uh, that can be made interactively um, in many cases. And so from the seed point, we trace the particle uh, and that approach we're focusing on the geometric flow. Um, we can do something quite similar, but instead of having a sparse set of carefully chosen seed points, we might think about taking a sort of visually complex texture and mushing it according to these trajectories. Um, and so this is usually called texture flow. And we see an example of that uh, in the lower left-hand corner, uh, lick line integral, integral convolution is one example of that. And then finally, way at the bottom, we have the example of, well, what if instead of waiting for our eyes to detect features, surely we can sort of see there seem to be some points there where things are swirling around. We could directly compute those uh, so-called topological features of the fluid flow things like uh, sources or sinks uh, or saddle points. Um, and so we could compute those and then show, uh, use any of these other methods to actually show the resulting uh, explicitly computed features. So some of the tasks people are trying to do um, when we uh, have looked at some empirical studies uh, of vector fields are things like finding critical points, um, identifying what kind of critical points, saddle or sink or uh, source, um, you know, at some location, what kind of critical point is there. Um, that idea of trying to trace particles or actually predict where a particle would end up, advection is what that's called, of understanding where a particle released at this spot would end up given that fluid flow shown. Now, what happens if instead of just thinking about this flow as something in the 2D plane, what if we're thinking about it within a 3D volume? Things get complicated. If we just tried to show everything in that 3D volume, it would be hopelessly cluttered. So when we're dealing with these three-dimensional vector fields, um, we typically need to do something very, very aggressive about cutting down the amount of data we show. So here's an example um, where we use what's called streamlines, the same idea of computing the trajectory that a particle will follow. So we go from that 3D vector field to uh, some, some number of seed particles. You can see here in this picture, they're in the lower right. Um, and we compute those trajectories. And then, then we derive more data. Then we say for each one of those streamlines, we're going to basically measure its squiggliness. Um, specific properties like curvature and torsion and tortuosity, and combine those all together into something we'll call a signature, which is basically a, a weighted combination of these different ways to measure the squiggles. And then we're going to cluster. So we're going to compute a cluster hierarchy across this whole set of these signatures, these weighted combinations of squiggliness, in order to group together um, these paths, right? These uh, streamlined paths that have roughly the same shape 
And then we can encode those with things like color and transparency. So in this picture, see how we've got the red streamlines and the purple streamlines? That's because they've been clustered according to this approach. So this is another example, uh, just like we see with dynamic aggregation of where a cluster hierarchy is something that we're using um, in order to uh, serve as the means towards the end of actually seeing these structures. So a thing to notice um, is this is very good for um, trying to understand shapes. That's really the goal behind this. And there could be millions of sample points um, in this uh, underlying vector field. And there could be, in fact, hundreds of streamlines. So this is a heavily computationally expensive operation. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of algorithmic processing to get to the point of being able to encode this, which is more easily describable just as an idiom. But in order to actually do these computations, you think at great length about the scalability. OK, and finally, let's talk about this idea of a tensor field. Um, so with a tensor field, that's where we have a lot of numbers, a lot of quantitative attributes at each cell. In fact, often we can think of what's going on there as an entire matrix at each of these cells. So not just one number, not just two numbers, many numbers. Um, and this can measure physical properties like uh, stress or conductivity or curvature or diffusivity of a material. Um, and so what's behind this approach, which is using glyphs, just like one of those approaches to uh, dealing with vector fields with glyphs, we can show tensor fields with glyphs. So we can derive data from this matrix. We can decompose it into shape. That's from things called the eigenvalues of the matrix or orientation. These are the eigenvectors in the matrix. These are derived properties we can get. And then we can encode those with a glyph like a 3D ellipsoid that can directly show both shape and orientation. And that's an example of what we see here. Again, we have a similar circumstance to the last one where we can't just show every single point within a three-dimensional volume. There's no hope of actually seeing the stuff in the middle. So there's quite a lot of sophisticated interaction techniques that are required to both sort of navigate around in this space and make choices about which parts to show and which parts to hide. Uh, so there's a lot of complexity in the interaction uh, in addition to the computation of all of these uh, kinds of spatial fields. So that concludes the discussion about um, using given spatial data as the way to arrange the spatial layout of the visualization. Um, in the previous segment, I talked about um, geographic and cartographic uh, data sets. And in this one, we were focused really on spatial fields, both scalar and vector and tensor. <laughs>